Hello and welcome back to the Frogs of War podcast. I'm Anthony North. That's Russ Hodges. We're back to talk all things TCU sports coming off of a March Madness week where TCU basketball picked up a win again in the, the first round of the NCAA tournament and again took a loss in the second round of the NCAA tournament just as it did last season. Um, also, some baseball and tennis and everything else going on. Um, but mostly, mostly the basketball, it was a, it was a big week, exciting week for the Horn Frogs to, to put on display on the, the national stage. Russ, how are you doing today? You know what? It's a Friday, man. Happy that it's a Friday and excited to get this weekend started. I was up in Wisconsin actually this past weekend at the bar with my brother watching the Arizona state game. Uh, tried not to make too much noise. At watching the Gonzaga game, I have some some neighbors that just moved in underneath me, and um, what, what a what a series of games! It's been a great week of uh, of March Madness, and I'm currently in tenth place out of ten in my bracket pool. So uh, not going well for me there, but um, excited to talk about TCU basketball and and ready to to get into this. Yeah, I think you just stop it at I'm in 10th place and then people <laughs> don't have to know that there's only 10 people competing. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh as you were saying, I'm in 10th place. I was like, "Oh wow, he made a big comeback from uh what he was saying from last week." Nope. nope yeah, if out if out I 10. was 10th okay. place in the in the National CBS Sports pool, I'd be a lot <laughs> more excited. I might be raking in uh quite a bit of dough there, but uh I think I've been I've been watching that that new show on Hulu Only Murders in the Building. Not sure if you've seen it. Really, no, really good show. Yeah. Um, that, that's been taking up some of my time instead of watching basketball. Now that I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hella out of it. So, oh, uh, that's good. Yeah, and and for our survivor pool people at, at Frogs of War, we've got after last night's uh, Tennessee loss to Florida Atlantic knocked about half the the remaining group out. We are down to just fifteen people remaining. I am somehow still one of them, uh, which is surprising. Normally in this game that I run every year, I'm one of the first people out. So I, I'm still living today. Friday um, includes the Creighton Providence game where all but three of the remaining people picked Creighton. So a chance to, if Providence continues its Cinderella run, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at potentially – a winner in that bracket pool as soon as, I don't know, as soon as tonight even. So uh, hopefully everyone that's that's in that has been following along. That's really fun to do. Um, but all right, let's get into the, the TCU basketball of it. So first game for the Frogs last week, a week ago today, last Friday, final game of the first round. In Denver, Colorado, TCU taking on the Arizona State Sun Devils. And um, it, it was an excellent basketball game, a back-and-forth basketball game, a thriller right to the finish. Um, TCU came out hot, um, making shots like crazy. Arizona State, however, was also making shots like crazy, way outperforming their, their season averages. Um, <clears throat> TCU got itself into into a big hole that it was able to climb out of as finally the Sun Devils kind of slowed down and, and started missing some some shots and TCU was was picking up those rebounds and closed with um it, an all time great TCU basketball moment. Jacoby Coles driving to the goal at the uh at the final seconds and, and drops in a floater over the seven footer shot blocker extraordinaire. Um just a a fantastic play that uh you know it it might get buried in all of the things that happen in the NCAA tournament but for the Horn Frogs it's a it's an all-time great moment. Yeah, I think Jacoby Coles I like to joke around he's got a lot of old man game. You see a lot of his moves that he does. He doesn't have anything really flashy but it's just good good fundamental basketball type techniques and to to be able to drive the lane there and put up a little floater get that to fall with two seconds left was was awesome to see the comeback um I was watching this game like I said and up in Wisconsin with my brother we were out at the bar watching the game and um everybody's out celebrating St. Patrick's Day I'm the lone guy watching the the TV watching the TCU game but 
Uh, huge credit to the Frogs for just being able to dig deep in the second half. I mean, there were moments in this game where it felt like Arizona State was going to take full control. And like you said, TCU came out, I think, uh, led 15-4 to four to start the game. And the Frogs are playing with great pace early on. I really liked what they were doing, attacking the basket. Uh, Chuck O'Bannon was knocking down shots in this game. Mike Miles was phenomenal in this game. He had 26 points to lead the way and took over the game at times on the offensive end. And that's what a a player of his caliber in these big moments, you you look for a guy like that to, to take over. And I thought he did that really well. But we talked last week about Arizona State for the season, shooting about 41% from the field, about 31% from three. Not a team that shot the ball particularly well on average for the season. But I think it's just college basketball teams get hot at the right time. And they scored almost 100 points against Nevada in that play-in game. So I was a little worried how hot Arizona State was going to come out in this game. I felt like the Frogs matched up fairly well. I don't think the big guy, Warren Washington, I don't think he was as big of a factor in this game as I thought he would be. But they came out and were hitting the most ridiculous shots. I mean, they were hitting baseline fadeaway turnaround jumpers. They were hitting step back threes, semi-contested shots, contested shots. You you have their little guard posterizing. He posterized someone. I can't remember who it was, but they they were just, they were playing with. I think it was Chuck O'Bannon maybe. Yeah. Yeah. they, They were playing with tremendous energy. Arizona state was, and, they they gave a, the Frogs a run for their money. I mean, they had the lead in the second half. I think it was about a 9-10 point lead. And TCU was going through a little bit of a spell there toward the end of the first half, early second half, where they were struggling to get things going in the half court. But the, the Frogs really dug in on the defensive end. I think they started to close out possessions. They were getting rebounds and just slowly scratched and clawed their way back into the game. They started attacking the basket again late in the game, getting to the foul line, and then Jacoby Coles with the perhaps the biggest shot of the season for, for TCU, hitting that runner with two seconds left. And it, it was an awesome game. This, this was an awesome game to watch, and really happy to see TCU come away with the win. Happy to see the Hypnotoad again make an appearance on the hardwood. Um, just just a, a fun game to see, and huge props to the frogs for, for not folding there in the second half and sticking through it, uh, doing what they do best. And that's playing great perimeter defense and, and getting out on the attack, getting out in transition, finding ways to attack the basket and, and not settling for those jump shots, uh, down the stretch there. So really good stuff from TCU. Yeah. I thought one key in the second half to the not folding was, Damian Ball had a was really struggling in the first half, had no points, no made baskets. Um, and in the second, he was still doing the things that he does, distributing the ball, playing pretty good defense. But second half, he made three three-pointers, um, which I'm not sure if he had three three-pointers in a game all season. Uh, so those were those were obviously huge points to uh, keep keep pace there in the second half where Arizona state certainly could have run away with it. Um, And then there late in the game, he had a steal and and a drive to kind of bait uh, Cambridge into a foul where he hits two free throws that, that give TCU the lead Um, kind of that, just a a flurry of activity there at the end of the game too, to uh, kind of like a, a back and forth where TCU looked like there was a chance for TCU to seal it. Um, and I'm trying to pull up which player for Arizona state hit the big shot, but, um, just a, a gnarly step back three pointer on Rondell Walker, where, uh, Arizona state hits the big shot to tie the game. I think it was it horn. Uh, da, da, da. I shouldn't, I should have known this already. Yeah. DJ horn, um, made the three pointer under 20 seconds to play ties the game up at 70 and, uh, you know, that's coming off of Mike Miles hits a free throw to make it a, a three point game, but it only goes one of two at the line to where um, TCU couldn't just put it away there. And uh, probably too much time on the clock to do the foul up three play. Um, you, you don't want to give them extend the game, give them extra opportunities at that. And and Horn, to his credit, just he, he made the shot. It was a 
Um, it was a dagger three. It it felt a little bit like uh, last season when uh, Benedict Matherin hit the three over Mike Miles to to bring that game closer towards an overtime. And it looked like this was headed that way. It, you know, the, TCU was going to get their last chance at it, but um, it seemed like okay, here here comes another overtime. We're we're in for an even later night than we already were um, before before Jacoby Cole's final shot and and big credit to Mike Miles on that final play to where Arizona State was sending all the defenders his way they sent sent the double team at him he was able to to kind of run off the double team get it to Coles and Coles kind of gives a move to to fake into the corner but driving at that at Warren Washington, like you said, I don't think he was not as much of a, a factor in the game as maybe mm-hmm. I expected or his statistics throughout the season made it seem like he was going to be. Um Mike Miles stuffed him on at the rim on a on a dunk attempt that was just a, a phenomenal athletic play from Miles. This game, Miles was, you know, we we sometimes don't talk enough about how remarkable he is and if you know if he is now played his last game at TCU we'll we'll find that out at some point over the next weeks and months but um just a, an incredible player and and probably deserves to have a future in, in professional basketball at at some point whether it's this season or or in the future but um yeah i mean pu- putting on <laughs> Uh, stuffing a seven footer at the rim when you're the point guard is, mm-hmm. is an impressive feat, but he, he distributes that play there at the end of the game, gets the ball to Coles where, you know, last season, uh, again, he, he tries to do it himself and runs into that trap at half court that the wild Arizona wildcats are able to knock him down and not draw a foul. And, take the ball away from him and force the overtime. So, um, you know, one of those maturity things from miles and, and he has a, as excellent as he was going into the season. And as he has been, um, in his TCU career, he, he continued to improve and continued to raise his stock, uh, at the national level. And, you know, if he hadn't been hurt for, for some of the season, I think he, he, gets a lot more love in the, you know, big 12 player of the year conversation and in the, in the national, um, you know, all American second, third team conversation. So um, anything else from the Arizona state game? I think, you know, it's, it's hard because, you know, back when, back when I was a student in the, uh, in the olden days in when TC was in the mountain West Getting to the tournament was a, a complete pipe dream, mm-hmm. much less winning a game in two consecutive seasons. I mean, even when the Frogs joined the Big 12, there were seasons where TC would not win a single Big 12 game and was, you know, with the step up to Power 5, was one of the worst Power 5, Power 6 um, programs in the country. So I don't want to gloss over the fact that TCU made the NCAA tournament and won an NCAA tournament game in two consecutive seasons. You know, do we want more? Could did, was the ceiling higher for this team? Absolutely, but I think uh, just to to take a moment of thanks to these guys, to to Jamie Dixon, to they they've absolutely raised the floor mm-hmm. of what TCU basketball could be. Yeah, Mike Miles, going off of what you said about him as an NBA talent, I think. The area where I was looking for him to show some growth was as a as a passer. I think last year he showed that he could score. He was a a big shot taker. He was more of a high volume scorer for TCU last year, which I think fit perfectly because that's what they needed. They needed a guy who could win one on one matchups and make tough shots, create shots for himself, and creating shots for other players. I think was where uh, he needed to grow if he wanted to you know take that next step to being a a really good NBA prospect and I think he's absolutely done that this year I mean we saw it in the Gonzaga game as well we'll talk about that here in a little bit but he showed this year that not only could he score and score a bit more efficiently with the same group of players largely but he also made some tremendous passes throughout the year and, and had some games where 
he was racking up assists and playing with Damian Baugh, who's more so a floor general, a guy who's not, you know, necessarily looking for his offense first is more of a, a true point guard that's going to run the offense and, and be the primary distributor. It could, it could sometimes be a challenge to always be looking to defer as well. But Mike Miles, I thought this year, took over games and took over the offense in times where he needed to and, and made key shots and scored points when TC really needed him to and, and showed that he can be a passer and he can make the necessary kind of passes that lead to results in the NBA. You know, some of the cross-court passes when you draw a double team, uh, being able to run pick and roll and find the big man cutting underneath to the basket. Um, he, he was awesome this year. And, and like you said, had he had he not gotten hurt, he's undoubtedly first team all Big 12. He's possibly a Big 12 player of the year candidate and perhaps even a candidate to be an All-American if he's not hurt and able to just continue to build on what he had done earlier in the season. So I think this was his uh, last run with TCU. I think he's definitely going to gonna go to the league. It's just a matter of when he announces it. But it, it's been a lot of fun watching him play and being him being a local uh, local talent, choosing to go to TCU when he could have potentially gone to a more prominent program was really awesome to see as well. So uh, big props to Mike Miles and uh, hoping that in the event he does declare for the draft, he has a, a really promising future in the NBA. Yeah, for sure. So I guess we'll move on to the, the Sunday game against the Gonzaga Bulldogs who advanced beyond the Grand Canyon Antelopes um, out of the first round to get to that contest with, uh, with the Horn Frogs in round two. And Gonzaga is is just a it's a beast to take on a team like this this is a um they were pushing for their eighth consecutive sweet 16 um i think they've they've made every tournament for forever um this is a as much of a blue blood program as you can be at this point over the last two decades of college basketball um and you know i think i think that brings with it some disdain and there's a lot of people who like to speak negatively about Gonzaga, but they uh, Mark few there has built a program that is um, clearly one of the best in the country. And so TCU got matched up with, with a bit of a juggernaut in the second round. And it was the kind of matchup as we expected, that was going to be very difficult for TCU um, without Eddie Lampkin, without a true big, presence to take on three-time consensus all-american drew timmy in the post and and timmy did his thing for for much of this game he um he was the leading scorer with 28 points um led all scores in the game he had eight rebounds three assists the, the entire offense runs through him and and he was able to to take advantage of some things despite himself getting in early foul trouble, but he really was able to draw fouls and um, give his Bulldogs every opportunity to go win this game. A, a game again where TCU had opportunities here. TCU had leads um, and Gonzaga is just that, that kind of team that, uh, you know, maybe with a little help from the officials, uh, we, we might talk about that but um, that you really have to fully put away as, as we saw last night, uh, UCLA was unable to put them away. And, and now Gonzaga is off into uh, the elite eight now. So um, I guess Russ, where do you want to go with the Gonzaga game? I'll, uh, I'll start with Drew Timmy because I think of all the three seeds that TCU could have potentially matched up against, Gonzaga was by far the worst matchup. Not to say Gonzaga is you know, the best team of the three seeds, but just because they have Drew Timmy, they run their entire offense seemingly through him, whether he's scoring out of the low post or drawing double teams, passing the ball out to the perimeter to create shots for guys like Strother and Bolton and Malachi Smith and others. 
it, it was just a matchup nightmare. And I know we talked about that on the podcast and people were talking on Twitter after the game. If, if Eddie Lampkin plays, you know, honestly, I think if Eddie Lampkin plays, does it make a huge difference? I really don't know because Drew Timmy is the kind of player that has such skill at this level that I think he gets 20 plus against practically anyone he's matched up against. But for, for the frogs, especially without Lampkin, it didn't matter who was guarding that man. If it was Xavier Cork, if it was Suleimani Dumbia, who actually got more minutes than usual in this game, I think just because of his size to, to put someone with, you know, a little bit more size, uh, but that didn't really matter. Drew Timmy almost broke that man's ankles on a on a drive to the basket. He got him. Ooh, to, he got him to come nasty. out from underneath, and then that that was a nasty move there. But it, it, it didn't matter who TCU had on him. It, it didn't matter if it was either of those guys or Jacoby Coles or Emmanuel Miller or Micah Peavy, who I actually thought did the best job on him than any other TCU defender in this game. And we know Micah Peavy's one of TCU's best defenders, but. The way he was fronting him in the post late in the second half, being physical with him, he, he gave a great effort there. It ultimately wasn't enough, but Drew Timmy, he took advantage of the mismatch. I mean, he was making almost every shot imaginable out of the low post. He was hitting hook shots with his offhand. He was going out and hitting three-pointers. He hit his, I think it was only his third three-pointer of the season that he made in this game. And mm -hmm. it, it's just the kind of night it was for him where not only was he on top of his game offensively, he was taking advantage of a horrible matchup and it didn't really matter. I think if TCU tried to double him because when they did double him more often than not, he passed it out. They got the ball swung around the three point line Bolton who struggled early in the game started knocking down shots in the second half. Strother, who struggled early in the game, started knocking down shots. Malachi Smith was big for them off the bench. And I thought that was kind of a theme in this game too, is TCU got off to another good start like they did against Arizona State. And Gonzaga is not really a team that's known for its defense. They're a team that likes to get out and run. They like to score. If the game is in the 80s or 90s, you think they're probably going to win it, you know, 90, 90 times out of 100. But I thought the pace of this game was a bit slower, and the Frogs took advantage of that, and Gonzaga wasn't really knocking perimeter shots down in the first half, and it's 38-33 to at halftime, and you're just hoping that TCU can continue to defend the way that it did in the first half, and you hope that guys don't get hot. And unfortunately, I think there was just a stretch midway through the second half where Gonzaga got on a run. Drew Timmy was getting everything he wanted down low. And guys started hitting shots, and that's what really turned the tide of the game. Gonzaga took the lead, and, and TCU ultimately wasn't able to get back. Shout out to Damian Baugh for the amazing backdoor cover. Uh, I think Gonzaga was favored by four and a half, and, and Damian Baugh with the half-court buzzer beater there to make it a, a three-point game. But I think ultimately, when it's when it's all said and done, you know, say what you will about Drew Timmy, uh, maybe getting some calls his way. Say what you will about the officiating. Say what you will about the missed free throws. TCU did miss six free throws in this game, but Gonzaga missed nine free throws. And Gonzaga also had some guys in foul trouble, too. I think as a whole, this game was just called a little soft. There were, there were a lot of soft calls in this game. And Drew Timmy single-handedly got, like, three guys in foul trouble for TCU. I think by the end of the first half, three different players had three fouls. So it, it was just a, it was a brutal matchup. And as well as Mike Miles played in this game, he was awesome in this game. Again, he had 24 points, hit a killer step back three, got the crowd into it, was drawing double teams, finding guys open on the perimeter. But Drew Timmy was the best player on the floor. In this game, he was the biggest player on the floor. He had four offensive rebounds. Uh, Anton Watson, another player who's more so known for his rebounding and his size down low, he had six offensive rebounds. And um, you just gotta you gotta tip your cap. I mean, a great player took advantage of a of a horrible matchup, and Gonzaga ran their offense through him, and it ultimately proved to be really effective. 
Yeah, the Bulldogs dominated on the glass and and really led by Watson. Twelve total rebounds for him. <clears throat> he was he was cleaning up everything. So at any time there was double team on Timmy, or you know you you got two people boxing out Timmy, he was right there to 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 clean everything up. So he had a huge game, was a huge contributor. Um, and and yeah, the free throw shooting probably wasn't nearly as problematic. It's just the the opportunities um, there in the game. So, yeah, TCU did miss eight free throws. That's a lot of missed free throws. Um, but the, the frequency with which Gonzaga was able to get to the free throw line, force foul trouble for an already depleted team, like you said, at halftime, I think O'Bannon and Coles and PV each had three fouls. Um, and then there were several others with two, something like that. So a um, lot of foul trouble for the Frogs. The foul discrepancy was was pretty big in this one. But, um, you know, I don't know. There were probably some of those that were too soft, but that's probably also part of what TCU had to do to, to match up with a, a team of this size and physicality that um, with TCU's smaller playmakers, you, you kind of needed to to put some bodies on them to make stuff happen. Um, for me, the the biggest officiating issue here. You mentioned the the mile step back that was just electric, and put the frogs back up by five to match their their halftime lead with about eleven or twelve minutes left in the game. It it felt like all right. Here's here it is. Here's the moment. Now TCU can can run off. Um, but the Gonzaga comes back down and hits a three to to cut that to two. And then on the the, the next possession, TCU is in position to score. Um, I think it's a Mike Miles pass to a cutting Shahada Wells backdoor cut under the basket. He's on his way to putting up a layup, and the refs blow a whistle. They claim that there was a kicked ball mm -hmm. um i don't it, sign him up for the the men's national team that kicked ball went right up immediately bouncing off the floor to shahada wells uh waiting hands um i i didn't i didn't see a kicked ball there it it felt like maybe the the ref blew that whistle a little fast in any case it was an opportunity there tc was about to potentially put the game up four points and instead um, was forced to, to take an out of bounds play that resulted in a, a bad shot um, that was blocked and then run down the court by Julian Strother passed off to someone. It was either Bolton or Malachi Smith. They were both seemed like they were making everything uh, from the three point line and put Gonzaga ahead and that was, you know, there was plenty of time left in the game, but that was that was a huge momentum shift to go from up five to down one in not very much game time there. And, and uh, TCU never never made it closer than that. Um, the rest of the way, never taking the the lead back. And and yeah, the the final the final tally of only losing by three points probably doesn't tell the story of how that the game ended. I mean, TCU was was down seven and kind of hit a miracle three pointer and then fouled with I don't know under a second remaining. Um, and Gonzaga makes those free throws was was up again and then yeah, ball hits that final three pointer to to send the gambling world into shambles or into uh celebration. But um, yeah, I think there, there were plenty of complaints about the officiating, but for me, none of them had an impact on the game, the way that single play uh, it, it felt like a moment as it happened. And as it turned out, that was, that was the last time TCU would hold a lead in the game. <clears throat> I thought something that stood out to me as well in this game was how Mike Miles, he drew a lot of double teams um, at the top of the three-point line when they tried to bring a high screener up. And TCU tried to double Drew Timmy as much as they could as well. But I think the difference was when 
Uh, when Gonzaga doubled Mike Miles and he was able to get the ball out to somebody, whether it was Chuck O'Bannon or Micah Peavy or Jacoby Coles, really they just didn't hit shots. Uh, Damian Ball, you mentioned hit three three pointers against Arizona State. He knocked down some some big spot up threes in this game as well. I believe there were a couple out of bounds plays where they would draw up a spot up three for him and he knocked it down. And I think that's more of his game. You know, he's not really a create your own shot kind of player, but I think he can knock down a, a spot up three if you get him an open look. And he knocked down a couple of open threes in this game. But the other guys, I think Chuck O'Bannon was three for 14, one for nine from three point range. Micah Peavy was three for eight. Jacoby Coles was two for five. And you're not going to get much offense out of Xavier Cork. Shahada Wells didn't give you any, anything in this game either. So uh, Drew Timmy, when he was doubled and get the ball out the perimeter, Gonzaga did a really good job of, of getting the ball swung around if that first look wasn't there. And, and like I said, Bolton, Strother, Smith, they all got into a rhythm as the game went on, especially in the second half. And Gonzaga just their their role players made shots. TCU's role players didn't make shots. And it's unfortunate for Chuck O'Bannon because he was so good in the Big Twelve tournament. And he also had a nice game against Arizona State. So it was it was tough to see him go out like that. Um he had some really good open looks and just couldn't get anything to go and was trying to pull up for some mid range shots as well. And I don't think that's really his game. Um He's more of a 3 and D type of player, in my opinion. But I think that was a huge factor in the game as well. It wasn't just the fact that Drew Timmy was so dominant. It was that when one team chose to double the opposing team's best player, who was going to step up? You know, for TCU, other than Damian Baugh, no one really stepped up. For Gonzaga, you had Bolton step up. You had Smith step up. Strother stepped up. And, and I think that was a huge factor in the game as well. Yeah, totally agree. The the O'Bannon, um, I don't know, Mr. Postseason, Mr. March moniker, unfortunately, did not live up here in the second round. I mean, yeah, one for nine from three pointers is is not going to get it done when that's kind of you're really relying on him to to make those shots in those situations. And like mm-hmm. you say, that's that's where that's where the game was won. Gonzaga was hitting those shots, and and TC was not. So. Um, you know, PV got one of them to fall, but yeah, one for four from three point range is is also not it. And and you know, I guess it makes me think about um, another player who is who is still playing in the NCAA tournament. Francisco Farabello, former mm. Horn Frog, is now with the Creighton Blue Jays. Uh, that they, they'll play tonight in the Sweet Sixteen against. Um, Princeton for a chance at the elite eight. And, you know, I think when he decided to transfer from TCU, the, the consensus and probably our, our frogs of war consensus as well was, well, you know, he's, he might get more minutes than he would here at TCU and we wish him the best. And, you know, we'll be fine. TCU will be fine without, without Farabello. Yes. He's, He's supposedly the sharpshooter for the Frogs uh, a season ago, but he was really only shooting like barely over 30%. He's he's had a pretty rough go of it for for Creighton this year. I think last I checked, he was averaging like three points and and It's true that he hasn't been the dude there either, Mm -hmm. but I think it it wasn't Farabello, but that mm, Jamie Dixon didn't bring in anything to – not only to replace Correct. Farabello, but to make an improvement upon that spot where you need somebody who can stand in, in the corner and when Damian Ball or Mike Miles are driving to the basket and and the lane collapses on them, that they can kick it out and you can feel confident that someone will hit the shot in the spot. Um, TCU didn't have that player, and whether it would have been Farabello or not, that's a. I, it feels like a miss from a roster building that this team never had that player on its roster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm really curious to see what this team looks like next year. And I think we'll talk about that at a little more length, maybe on a future podcast. But 
there's going to be a lot of turnover on this roster. We talked about Mike Miles likely going pro. I have to believe Damian Baugh is likely going to go pro as well. We're, we're going to talk about Emmanuel Miller here in a little bit, but um, you have some some big guys who were not effective really at all this season. You have a player in Rondell Walker who transferred in this year and was essentially a non-factor throughout the entire season. Uh, P.J. Haggerty was a, a three-star recruit who's come in and is reportedly in the transfer portal already after one season. So it, it, I think Jamie Dixon is going to need to hit the portal hard to bring in some veteran players really all around because think about the players that you could potentially have coming back next year that play significant roles. Jacoby Coles, Micah Peavy, um, possibly Emmanuel Miller, Shahade Wells, Xavier Quick. It gets very, it drops off after, you know, those first two or three guys. So it, it, this is going to be a, a drastically different roster next year. And I think the expectations after this pair of seasons that TCU has had is the, the expectations I think are going to be very different. Um, I'm interested to see how it unfolds. I know TCU has two recruits coming in with a lot of talent, Jace Posey, who's a four-star guy, and then Isaiah Manning, who's kind of a tweener, three, four uh, forward. So um, there, there are like 300 plus players, I think, in the portal already, a lot, a lot of guys. So I, I have confidence that Jamie Dixon and his staff can hopefully go out and get some difference makers, but um, it, it's going to be a, a different roster and, and hopefully – whoever they do bring in can spread the floor a little bit because it's, I just feel like it's tough to really reach that next level as a team when you don't have the shooting, you can play phenomenal defense. And I thought TCU played great defense this year, but especially if you're play having to play small and you don't have that elite shooting, it's going to be very difficult to beat some of those blue blood programs and some of those teams that make deep runs in the tournament every year. Yeah. And we, we have seen what the transfer portal has done around the country and in the big 12 as you know, Kansas state going into the season, new coach, Jerome Tang, they had like two players on the roster and he comes in, brings people in from, from all over the transfer portal. Obviously Keontae Johnson has been a star uh, for them. And, you know, they're now in the elite eight. They've, they've been able to build that roster through transfer portal um, in the right way that, um, you know, build around Marquise Noel and, and here they are, you know, potentially they're, they're making a run at a national championship here. And um, so it's, it's the kind of thing that can be done. You, you have to bring in the right guys. You have to be willing to, to go and make it happen in the, uh, in the transfer portal that, um, you know, maybe Dixon was handcuffed a little bit by the will they, won't they go pro with, with uh, Mike Miles and Damian Ball last season. Um, and knowing that he was bringing back this, this roster, but even so to, to kind of leave it as is without bringing in, some high level big man or some high level shooter um you know it's an opportunity missed i think that going into this season all off season the the expectation for this horn frogs team was to make the sweet 16 so in that in that case this team did not succeed in that goal um and it's it is disappointing uh, you know, TCU entered the season like number 14 in the AP poll. Um, so they're, you know, it's it's not a disappointment on the level of like North Carolina who went into the season ranked mm-hmm. number one and didn't make the tournament. So, you know, it, the season is successful, but I don't know that we can say that this was a success, um, which is unfortunate with the level of talent that TCU had. You know, we talked about whether – we thought PJ Haggerty should have had his red shirt pulled so that uh, he could come in and be a, a contributor on this team. Who knows whether he had the skills and talent to, to bring this team up a level, but um, 
yeah, transitioning into into off season news, I guess we're we're here in the off season for for the Horn Frogs. Haggerty has announced or has has put his name into the transfer portal, um, and so we may never know what he would have looked like um, for the Horn Frogs in a full complete season. He was the only high school recruit uh, brought in in the class of twenty two, and he did get some run early in the season in the non-conference season and, and played, you know, pretty okay. But um, he was clearly shelved with that red shirt held. And, you know, maybe that was Dixon giving him a, an olive branch to let whatever his next destination have him for an extra year. I don't know, but um, you know, I, I, hopefully he goes through this transfer portal process and, and makes his way back to Fort Worth and, um, decides to stick it out here with the frogs, but um, I guess <laughs> Russ, I, I didn't mean. I guess we didn't need to move on to the to the off season so fast. Did you have any closing thoughts just on the season and a, as we look back on this these, this two year run of this roster, what they did, what they accomplished for TCU basketball? No, I think um, I think you're exactly right in the assessment that. It was a, a successful year. You won over 20 games, but you still fell short, I think, of of not only expectations, but I think it's just frustrating for some people because you get stuck on what this team could have been. When you go back to the the knee injury to Mike Miles, the ankle injury to Eddie Lampkin, all the Eddie Lampkin drama that took place before the Big 12 tournament, and you saw what TCU could do at full strength playing its best basketball putting 100 points up on Oklahoma State, dominating Kansas on the road, uh, really playing well against Kansas State earlier in the season, beating Kansas State twice. I mean, that's a team that's in the Elite Eight now that TCU beat twice out of three matchups during the regular season. Pretty handily twice, too. And I think that people look at what this team could have been. We talked about what what kind of accolades Mike Miles could have earned, but I really think that this could have been a 25 to 26 win basketball team had everybody stayed healthy and kept their head on straight and, and just played good basketball. And I think it's a a reason why people are a little disappointed with how things have turned out. Yeah. You made it back to the second round. Yeah. You won another tournament game and that's all positive, uh, positive stuff, but it could have been more than that. And I think it's also compounded by the idea that who knows what this team is going to, is going to do next season. I mean, just looking at the backcourt right now, let's say that Mike Miles and Damian Baugh both declare for the draft. PJ Haggerty is in the portal. Shahade Wells is the only guard on the roster, really. He and Rondell Walker, but who knows what's even going to happen with Rondell Walker. I mean, he was at Oklahoma state came to TCU I know he was uh, a teammate with Mike Miles on the on the FIBA roster, I think, but he he was a non-factor. So is he going to try and stick around for another year, or is he going to transfer? You know, Shahade Wells may wind up being the only guard on this roster who got minutes that's going to be back next year. So it's it's going to be a drastically different team, and who knows when when TCU can get back to this kind of position, especially knowing how difficult of a conference the Big 12 is. So, And is going to continue to And is going to continue Houston to be with, and, yep, yeah. with, with Houston and, and BYU and Cincinnati. Um, we know Cincinnati's had success in basketball. BYU's had success in basketball. Uh, and, and even UCF has as well, but Houston especially. So, um, yeah, I think the season as a whole, it was a good season. I think the team fell a little bit short of, of expectations, but now it's all about who's who's staying and who's going. And uh, we know now that Emmanuel Miller has declared for the draft, and he's a two-time All Big Twelve honorable mention. He's played a big role for TCU over the last couple of years. I think he averaged just over twelve points and six and a half rebounds this year. And um, hopefully, I, I think he is the kind of player like Mike Miles last season. I think he would really benefit from one more year. I know he's a senior. He's a four-year senior. He has a COVID year to use. I think if he were to come back 
he could potentially be a focal point for the TCU offense. This year it was really uh, Mike Miles and Damian Baugh. He was kind of the third option offensively. I think he would have a chance to be uh, a number two guy, maybe even a number one guy next year. I'm not really sure with what kind of backcourt they'll have. So I think he could have a bigger role next season. And I also think that he still has a lot of room to grow as a player. I think he's a really good athlete. Um, Offensively, I think he's still got to expand his game a little bit. I actually saw his, he shot well over 30% from three point range this year, which surprised me because I felt like most of the games I watched, he didn't really knock down many of those shots. So maybe I just was watching the wrong games, but I, I, th- I think he still has a lot of room to grow a- as a player. And I think if he were to come back, uh, he could really be a focal point. So, so we'll see what happens there. I don't know. What are your thoughts on, on, on him, whether or not you think he should stay or go? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it would, it's, I'm always going to say it would be beneficial to, to come back. Um, you know, I haven't, I'm not deep in the NBA mock draft game, so I don't I don't really know if he his name is showing up anywhere. Um but I, I think he does have his statistics this season, if maybe not the volume, if you just look at the numbers, it, it's the kind of thing that would jump off the page. So I mean he shot over fifty percent from the field, shot just under forty percent from three points. So I mean if if a if a scout just looks at those two numbers and his physicality and his his game i i could see him definitely you know getting a chance to to get into the nba and maybe earn a two-way contract or um you know the 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 Kenrich Williams route to uh to Kenny hustle his way into um real nba minutes I, I can see that path, and so would understand if he's ready to to take that path. Um, but certainly, you know, free throw shooting at sixty five percent, you can't really have that. That's probably a a non starter in the NBA. Uh, it's that's not good enough. Um, but I think if if he adds to the volume on the three pointers and adds to kind of his his all around game, you know, I think maybe it's a, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I think he should come back and he should be the star of this team next season. And if he does that, that could put him into a, a better position um, going forward. Let me see if I can pull up some stats on the actual number of, eh, that's a game log. Um you know, Man, I think with, just got with this Miller, by season, but yeah, you know, with with Miller, I think his offense is more inside out, and size wise, he's he's six seven, two two twenty. I think he's he's built well, but I think for for TCU, he was more of a power forward, uh, kind kind of a tweener. But you had guys also like Chuck O'Bannon, who was more of a pure three, Micah Peavy, who I think is. Uh, more of a pure three, whereas Miller was kind of a a three playing the four. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like he he had a mm-hmm. an inside out offensive game where he's when he's scoring, he's trying to score around the rim. the The perimeter shooting was a, a subset of his game, but I think if he were to go to the NBA, being six seven and not being six nine or six ten, he he's going to have to be much more of a perimeter player at the next level. And I don't really know if that's what he is right now. I think he was much more of a interior presence for TCU this year. Whereas if he would potentially come back for one more year, expand his offensive game, we know that he can defend pretty well. He can rebound pretty well, but if he can expand his offensive game and become uh, a, a better score from the outside and a bit more versatile of an offensive player, I think he would definitely raise his his draft stock. I think if you looked at it right now, of the three players, Mike Ma, Mike Miles, Damian Baugh, and Emmanuel Miller, I think Mike Miles will be drafted. Not exactly sure where. Uh, Damian Baugh, I think would 
potentially have a chance to be drafted in the second round. Otherwise, I think he's probably a a two way contract or an undrafted free agent kind of player. I, I see Emmanuel Miller being an undrafted free agent. I think he is the kind of player that would really benefit from from one more year. And, and for what it's worth, this is me, uh, associate editor at Frogs of War, and a TCU sports fan making that right. assessment. But I, I just feel that. With certain players, you know when they're ready as a fan and as, you know, just someone who watches a lot of basketball. And some players where you look like they, if they just had one more year, you know, they could make this improvement, that improvement, and and really become more NBA ready. That's where I think Emmanuel Miller is right now. Yeah, totally agree. And so I, I found the the numbers on his three point shooting. So I, I think he probably, if he comes back, he needs to double this. He, he improved vastly um, year over year from, from the year prior, he was 24% three point shooting on 45 attempts. Um, this season, he was 20 of 51 for 39% shooting on three pointers. Um, but 51 three point shots is, you know, what's that like two a game or so. Yeah, so it's not yeah. a lot. And a lot of that's, those that's are spot-up looks, too. A lot of those are spot-up looks and plays where he's not really having to sort of create his own shot. Yeah, so I think that's where if he does come back and and he's allowed to grow that part of his game, his draft stock could certainly grow quite a bit from where mm-hmm. it is today. If he maintains a 39% three-point shooting and, you know, increases his volume by 50% even, then then it's that's a huge jump that he'd be able to make in in my opinion. All right. Um is that all for basketball? Are we I think so. Yep. I think we're I think we've covered everything for basketball and uh I'll go ahead and just give the rundown here for the baseball stuff. Uh TCU baseball has played quite a few games over the last week. Uh TCU started Big 12 play on Friday, so last Friday, uh, playing at Oklahoma, TCU winning big on Friday, 13-5. to Braden Taylor homered in this game. Carson Bowen, the freshman, also homered in this game. Ryan Vanderhei had kind of a mixed outing. He walked four batters, but was still able to work around some trouble and was able to earn the win, his second win as a, as a starter for TCU. But this game Friday was really the only highlight of the weekend TCU losing three to one on Saturday and seven to five blowing a two run lead on Sunday, giving up four runs in the seventh inning to, to lose that game. So TCU losing its first big 12 series of the season. They will start another series at home against Kansas this weekend. Just a couple little notes from the the two losses Saturday and Sunday. Cole Klecker started on Saturday, had another pretty good outing through five innings, only gave up two runs. He's been, I think, TCU's best freshman pitcher by far. He's commanded a a weekend spot in the rotation and really hasn't had a bad outing so far this season. So he's been impressive. Ben Abel, the left-hander, another freshman, struck out five guys in two innings pitch on, on Saturday. So he had a really good relief effort in that game to, to help TCU stay close. Braden Taylor in total was... He was on a burner this weekend. He had three home runs. He had a home run Friday, home run Saturday, which was the only run of the game, and then another home run on Sunday. So TC's offense struggled on Saturday. They only had two hits in that game. And then um, Sunday, TC got out to a 5-3 to three lead. Errors were a problem in this game. Again, unfortunately, we've talked about the errors uh, a bit too much, and they, they had uh, – Two or three errors, I believe, in the game Sunday. Of the seven runs that they gave up, only three of them were earned. So uh, defense continues to be an issue for for TCU. And unfortunately, not getting off to a hot start in Big 12 play, but a couple of midweek games where TCU looked a lot more impressive. Tuesday, beating Abilene Christian 7-0, to and then Wednesday, beating Northwestern 9-2. to The first time this year, I think, that TCU has had two midweek games as opposed to just one. But Chase Hoover and Braden Sloan did the pitching, both freshmen. Uh, Chase Hoover has pitched largely in relief. He's been a a long-inning reliever, but 
this was his first start, I believe, of the season, and he was awesome in this game. Through seven innings, struck out four, only gave up two hits, no earned runs. Cohen Fieser came on in relief and, and locked it down. So TCU uh, cruising over Abilene Christian. Luke Boyers hit a home run in that game, and he had a home run uh, against Northwestern. And, and he's a guy that we've talked about a few times, uh, one of those complimentary uh, position players that has been kind of scuffling. His average uh, now is back into the 220s, but prior to these two midweek games, he was hitting in the 180s. So uh, a player that really can hopefully use these two games as a, a springboard for this Big 12 series coming up against Kansas. Boyers had three RBIs against Abilene Christian. Braden Sloan got the win against Northwestern. He pitched six innings, allowed only four hits, one earned run. Again, Luke Boyers homered in this game. Cole Fontenelle homered in this game, and he actually drew the start at first base. So he's a guy now that's played multiple different positions. He's been a DH. He's played left field. He's played first base and third base. So uh, a super utility player, a switch hitter, I believe, as well, and, and showing some power. He's had multiple home runs this season. So uh, potentially a growing role for Cole Fontenelle for TC right now. Um, Elijah Nunez had three RBIs against Northwestern, another player that's got off to a really good start and then suffered a concussion, got dinged on the head by a pitch and was out for a little bit, came back and has been kind of struggling a little bit. So nice to see him have a good game against Northwestern. TCU is now 12 and nine overall. And I believe they have dropped out of the top 25 rankings after losing to uh, Texas State and, and losing two out of three to Oklahoma, they've gone from number 11 to unranked. So that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big drop off there. But to be honest, I think that's not necessarily unwarranted given the, the inconsistencies that we've seen from the defense, from the starting pitching, and um, even from the offense as well. So uh, a chance to get back on it against Kansas this weekend. Yeah, that's a that's a big series coming up. I guess just looking back, yeah, uh, Braden Taylor is now his seven home runs are tied for the conference lead um, with three others. And the concerning thing there, though, and really the concerning thing uh, across the board for TCU is the batting average is is quite poor. TCU is now seventh in the conference in batting average. Um, ahead just barely over Kansas going into this weekend series against the Jayhawks, and then pretty significantly ahead of Baylor. Baylor is hitting sub-250 on the season, um, really having a rough time down there in Waco with their their new coaching staff. But for the Horn Frogs, I mean, uh, Braden Taylor is, um, yeah, his, his seven home runs, but he's slugging like sub, yeah, sub-520 on slugging, which is, you know, everybody else in, in the top, I don't know, 20 of home runs is slugging 600 or better. So he's just, he's getting home runs, but he's not getting on base. Um, his, his on base plus slugging is 0.909. So under one, it's, um, that's probably not what you want to see. He's getting on base under 40% of the time. Um, so really would like to see it. It's great to see him knock bombs, um, all over the field, but would like to see him, um, get on base, get extra base hits as well. Um, and, and really across the board for the entire lineup. I mean, uh, TCU last season was getting on base at, at a very high rate and, and early in the season was as well, able to move those those runners around, really work the base paths as well, because TCU is is has the talent on on the bases. The, those stolen base numbers are great, but uh, you have to get on base for that to matter. So um, would like to see the fielding improve and and that that batting average improve, um, and you know. Dropping a, a road series to open Big 12 play isn't isn't the end of the world. It's it's not going to to hurt you in the long run too much. But um, really had a chance there on that Sunday game 
had the lead late and just let it kind of just drift away there. And, and if you come away with a series win there, you're, you're feeling really good. So that, that one really one bad inning kind of puts a, puts a big damper on what TCU was building there. And, um, Really big series coming up against Kansas. Uh, you'd really like to see a sweep at home over the Jayhawks, um, a team that that TCU is just simply a, a more talented team than. But you have to go out and execute, and and we'll see if they are able to get that done this weekend. Um, we're here right at the hour mark, so we'll just uh, quickly touch on the tennis and beach volleyball things. Um, tennis had a good and a bad week. So um, took a ranked win over Illinois, uh, four to one uh, over the weekend, but had a midweek contest, a non-conference contest against the Texas Longhorns, uh, whom they had beaten earlier in the season in Chicago in the indoor national championship final. Um, And in this one, the Longhorns were able to kind of run away with it against, against the Frogs. It's TCU's first loss of the, of the season. Um, they did drop the doubles point now in consecutive matches, um, losing the point against Illinois before before running off four straight singles wins, but then losing it again against Texas and unable to recover. Um, Frogs are are still at the top of the rankings, and you know losing to to Texas isn't going to hurt you, but. Um, it's an it's an unfortunate loss to to see that perfect season go away. Uh, I think I think TCU still certainly is one of the top teams in the country, and will have um, a contest this weekend against USC, also nationally ranked. So um, I think that might be tonight, actually. So if it's stopped raining here in Fort Worth, maybe uh, they'll be able to get that that contest in tonight here on the Purple Courts. Um, the la- which is the last non-conference game before conference schedule starts next week, next Friday. Um, let's see. Also, yeah, the beach volleyball um, competed last weekend on the road in Miami, taking uh, all four of their contests there in that invitational tournament with three ranked wins over USC, Florida International, and Florida Atlantic. Um, TCU continues to, to dominate there. They are playing today, maybe playing right now as we record, um, here back in Fort Worth for, uh, for four more contests this weekend. So we'll have, we'll have you covered on all of that, um, on the website. Thanks to, to Corey Coons covering that for us. And, um, we will cover all of everything happening at TCU. There's a lot of stuff, you know, spring football has started. We'll start getting some reporting on on that as, as news starts coming out. Um, NFL pro day is next week. Spring, spring game is a few weeks away. So a lot happening here at, at TCU sports and, and we'll keep you covered at frogs of war on the website, frogs And you can follow us there, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, everywhere you get your information. We'll be delivering you the horn frog information. That's all I have for today, Russ. I know you've got to run. Uh, thanks for for hopping on here with me on a Friday afternoon, and um, I'll close it there. Go frogs! Go frogs! Have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs>